Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Tomorrow noon, from 12 o'clock to 1.15, we will be having our annual fundraising luncheon at the Galleria, uh, the Weston Hotel. We will have almost 900 uh, people there who uh, love DTS or have not yet grown to love DTS. And the purpose of that lunch is to uh, do some romance uh, in those relationships. So it is a very strategic day for us. Uh, it has uh, been very fruitful for us in the last number of years in building uh, friendship and having people wrap their hearts and lives around the ministry of DTS. And uh, as you know, we have only two uh, rivers of resource uh, for the funding of Dallas Seminary. One is the gracious gifts of our donors and the other is tuition. Uh, quite honestly, the, the better the former, uh, the lower the latter. And so you have reason to pray. And uh, uh, we have 15 year and 50 year out planning going on that uh, we have as a deep desire of our heart in passing the baton to the next generation, not to allow money to be the reason a student can't come or couldn't stay at Dallas Theological Seminary. And that's really the, uh, the heartbeat of where we're headed in terms of our funding uh, planning and priorities. So uh, would you pray uh, about tomorrow with us as we uh, have student testimonies, as we have a graduate speaking, as we ask those people to get on board with us and to uh, commit over the next five years to be impact partners uh, with DTS. And so uh, as you uh, sit down for your noon meal tomorrow, just say, I, I, I need to thank God uh, for my food. I need to pray for more food. Uh, in a, a daily way, and we would appreciate that much. It's my privilege to introduce you to our speaker this morning. Uh, Dr. Ron Rhodes earned his Doctor of Theology degree from Dallas Theological Seminary, and he serves presently as the president of Reasoning from Scriptures Ministry, which is a Frisco, Texas-based apologetics ministry. He is the author of uh, 45 books, including his latest release, Wonder of Heaven, a Biblical Tour of Our Eternal Home. He regularly addresses current issues in the national media and speaks at conferences across the United States and Canada. Uh, his great joy, besides his faith in Christ and his life, is his wife Carrie and their two college-age children, David and Kylie. Uh, Ron also serves as an adjunct uh, faculty member for us in the Department of Theological Studies. Uh, would you join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Ron Rhodes to our platform this morning. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm going to be speaking this morning about how to make a point without impaling someone upon it, a skill I find increasingly practical in ministry. Not long ago, I was speaking at a big church in Santa Fe, New Mexico, a couple of thousand people. And I always like to go to the back of the church by the door as people are leaving so that I can chat with them as they're exiting. It's great to get to meet God's people, especially while you're on the road. And as an author, I always enjoy meeting people who have read my books. I mean, that just makes all the difference. And so there I was, and there were these two sisters that walked up to me. And I could tell that they were sisters because their faces looked alike. They had similar hairdos, similar dresses, similar mannerisms. Their voices were tonally the same. And they were grinning from ear to ear, both of them. So initially I was wondering, I wonder why they're so happy. So they're walking up to me with this big grin on their faces and then the first sister speaks up. And I think that she meant to say something nice. But what she said was, and she had a big smile when she said it, she said, oh Ron, your words this morning were like water to a drowning woman. And so I'm thinking, did she get her words wrong? I mean, she had a big smile on her face, and by her mannerisms, I think she meant to pay me a compliment. But she said, water to a drowning woman. So I decided to give her the benefit of the doubt, and I said, why, well, praise the Lord, that's great. That's, that's, that's wonderful. So, and then her sister hopped in, and she said, oh yes, Ron, why, your sermon this morning was absolutely superfluous, just absolutely superfluous. <laughs> so I thought to myself, 
maybe it's a genetic thing. You know, and so, it could be that in their family they have a thing where they meant to say something, but then there's a cross circuit in the brain and then they say something else. But I wasn't quite sure. So I said, isn't that something? Isn't that something? Now at this point I felt slightly impaled, okay? Slightly impaled. Then the first sister speaks up again and she asked me the strangest question that I've ever co heard come from any human lip anywhere on planet Earth. Strangest thing ever. She said to me, Ron, do you plan on publishing your sermons posthumously? <laughs> and so I said, you know, I've never thought about that. <laughs> but sure, why not? And she said, good, good, the sooner the better. <laughs> This was going from bad to worse. <laughs> now I felt really impaled. So then I said to them, I said, you know, I, I want to thank you for coming out today. Uh, it's been wonderful chatting with you. I think I'm going to go over to the book table now because there's a crowd gathering over there. But God bless you. Good to see you. So I made a beeline for the book table. And I spent about 20 minutes over there. And uh, people started to disperse at that point. And uh, then I looked up and lo and behold... Those two sisters were walking at me again. There they were. So I'm praying to myself, Lord, this will be a great time for the rapture of the church. Lord, if, you could just, if you could just beam me up now, Lord, it would be wonderful. So they came up to me, but this time they fessed up. They said, Ron, we want to confess. Uh, we didn't really mean that stuff we said back then. Uh, we actually heard those lines from a comedian. And well, we just, we just wanted to try it out on a real life human. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, you are a really good sport, and, and we want to thank you for that. And then they went on to talk about how some of my books had indeed blessed them. And uh, so by the time I left, I felt much better. You know, within 30 minutes, I had been impaled, and then I felt blessed. And as I was driving away, I started to uh, resonate in my mind about that passage in James 3 that talks about how our words should be consistent. You know, our tongues should not be instruments which speak words of grace and then words of ungrace. Our tongues should not be instruments that build people up and tear people down. Now, they were just kidding, so I'm cutting them some slack. But you know, all we have to do is look at our own lives to see how relevant uh, it is in James 3 when it talks about that fact. And uh, as someone who has spoken in many, many churches across America, I can tell you that James 3 remains relevant for us. Uh, if I could, I'd like to read it to you. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be so. And I've spoken in some of the biggest churches in America, and I can tell you that there are pastors of mega churches who struggle with this. I can tell you that there are Dove Award-winning music ministers that are struggling with their tongue. I can tell you that there are elders of church boards who struggle with this. And so I think it's very relevant for us as seminary folks uh, to focus on this issue just a little bit before we get out there. And minister, and my hope is that by the time I'm done, you'll learn from some of my mistakes. Hopefully, you'll never meet those sisters, but uh, hopefully, you'll learn some principles that will guide you in how you can use your tongue. I'm going to use James as a launch pad, but I'm going to tie some of the Proverbs in with it. Personally, I hear the Proverbs reverberating throughout the halls of this rich passage. I see a number of Proverbs that directly touch upon. Uh, what James is talking about here. So let's just look at a couple of these. Just seven principles very briefly. First of all, the tongue may be a little thing, but in God's economy, faithfulness in little things is a big thing. Would you agree with that? It's an important point. Fact is, is that you might be a great orator, speaking great sermons in churches, but if you cannot control your tongue in private, you've not yet mastered the master's will. Uh, you might know Hebrew and Greek and be a fantastic exegete, but if you cannot control your tongue, 
you're going to find yourself in trouble. God calls us to faithfulness in regard to this little instrument. A second broader principle is a survival principle. The way you use your tongue can either bless and bolster your ministry or it can blemish and burn your ministry. Proverbs 13.3 puts it well. The one who guards his mouth preserves his life. The one who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Now you know when I was a seminary student way back in the days of Moses or maybe it was right after the flood. I don't remember. It was way back then. I got to know a student quite well. And this student was a nice guy, but he had a really sharp tongue. Uh, He had a a tendency to say things just out of the blue that sounded very offensive. And I came to see that maybe this was a blind spot for him. So I decided to meet with him, sit down over lunch and talk to him about it. And I just had a heart-to-heart with him. And I asked him if he was aware of how he came across to some people. I felt that it could be an impediment to his ministry in the future. So I felt that love compelled me to do this. So we had a good chat. About a week later, a Dallas Seminary faculty member decided to do the same thing. This Dallas faculty member sat down and talked with him heart to heart about the fact that he had a sharp tongue and had a tendency to be offensive. Well, lo and behold, after he graduated, he took a church. He lasted about a month. And then the church let him go because he couldn't control his tongue. He's not been in ministry since. Now, my friends, this is an an exception, grant you. But the fact is, is that this guy was brilliant in Hebrew, in Greek, in theology. He had all the other skills down. But because he could not control his tongue, he burned out. He just crashed and burned in terms of ministry. Uh, This is something not to take lightly. If any of you are struggling with this, you run not walk, run to get help now before graduating. It's a critically important point. Number three, it's not what you say, it's not just what you say, but how you say it as well. Uh, Boy, I tell you what, I could spend the rest of my uh, time just talking about this one point. As Proverbs 18, 21 puts it, death and life are in the power of the tongue. I remember when I graduated from my doctoral degree, uh, I went to Southern California with my wife. I had no money. I was flat broke. Can you identify? Spent all my money on my degrees. So I went to Southern California, one of the most expensive places ever to live, and I'm looking for a place to live with my wife, Carrie. Finally, we found the cheapest apartment we could find anywhere. It was still twice as much as we could afford. But we walked into this apartment, and there was a landlord standing there marking stuff off this list. And as he was marking stuff off this list, my wife, Carrie, walked up to him. Now, you've got to understand that my wife, Carrie, is grace incarnate. She is just full of grace, full of kindness, full of compassion, full of good words, and she would never offend anyone. And so she walks up to this man, and this man uh, is just standing there uh, practically ignoring her, and my wife says, excuse me, sir, would you mind me if I asked you just a couple of questions about the apartment building? And this man said, grumpily, young lady, I'll be the one asking the questions. Ooh. So we kind of backed off a little bit. And then he looked over at me and he said, so what's your story? Are you looking for an an apartment? And I said, well, yeah, I just graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary, in fact. And I'm out here taking a position with the Christian Research Institute and we're looking for an apartment. And then he lit up. Praise the Lord. You're from Dallas Theological Seminary? You graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary? Why, I graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary too. Oops, oops. You could have heard a pin drop at that point because all three of us recognized what had just happened. You see, here was a Dallas Seminary grad whose words should have been full of grace, but they were words of ungrace. Let me tell you something, I cut him some slack. I found out that the tenant previous to us had trashed the place, so he was in a bad mood. And besides, I know that I've misused my tongue on occasion, so I cut him some slack. But this illustrates perfectly what we're talking about. It's not just what you say, it's how you say it. And once you're in a church context or in a missionary context, this is gonna make all the difference in how you relate to people and deal with people. Number four, before you open your mouth, consider the possibility that you don't know all the facts. As Proverbs 18, 13 puts it, he who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. Well, it's time for confession. 
Could, could you live with a little confession right now? It's good for brothers to confess to each other. Is that right? After I'd have been involved in cult apologetics for about 10 years, I got a phone call from a guy named Kurt in, in Denver, Colorado. And Kurt said, Dr. Rhodes, I really need to speak to you for about 10 or 15 minutes if I could, if you could spare that for me. And I said to him, well, you know, I'm sorry, I've got a uh, phone meeting coming up with my publisher in about five minutes. There's a lot of people involved, so I really can't get out of it. And uh, I'll take your phone number down and I'll call you either later this week or at, at the latest by the end of next week. I wasn't trying to put him off, but the fact is, is that most people that call into our ministry just need some help on witnessing to the cult or they just need, need some information. That's what I thought this was about. So then Kurt said, well, Dr. Rhodes, if I could just have five of your minutes, I'll be brief. I, I just really need to talk to you. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I, I don't have five minutes. I've got this meeting coming up in just a minute or two, so I'm gonna go ahead and take your phone number and I'll call you back, okay? And then he said, well, could I just tell you one thing, Dr. Rhodes? And I said, well, sure. And I was just a little bit impatient when I said it. And he said, Dr. Rhodes, uh, I just read your book on how to reason from scriptures with the Mormons. And I'm a Mormon, and I just became a Christian after reading your book. And now the Mormon authorities have gone to my wife and told her that she needs to divorce me immediately. Because as you know, Dr. Rhodes, a Mormon woman cannot find the highest salvation in Mormonism without being married to a Mormon man. And so the Mormon church is helping her in her divorce against me, and I need help. That changed everything. It changed everything. Of course, I canceled the phone meeting with the publisher. Of course, I made immediate time to help this fellow human being in need. And I was ashamed that I hadn't taken the time to listen and find out all the facts before so easily dismissing what he said. And I've never forgotten that lesson. I've never made that mistake again. Now when somebody calls me, I listen before I speak. My friends, if you wanna be effectively used in ministry, I don't care whether it's on the mission field or in a church, you need to listen to people before you speak. Very important. Number five, he who can suppress a moment of anger may prevent a day or a week of sorrow. Amen? Very important. He can, who can suppress a moment of anger may prevent a day or a week of sorrow. You know, most of this hinges on patience. I have a little test I like to give people on patience. Could I give it to you? You see, most of us are not near as patient as we think we are, and so therefore I like to give just a little bit of a test. When you put something in the microwave and you're gonna microwave it for one minute, do you stop it two or three seconds early? <laughs> do you? You're impatient. You just can't wait for the full minute, can you? You just gotta stop it early. Well, of course I'm kidding with you, but the fact is, is that very often it is impatience that causes us to momentarily flare up and we say something in just a moment of time and we're sorry for it for the rest of the day. It could be the rest of the week. It could even be longer. Now this is particularly relevant for those of you who are married. You say something to your spouse in a moment of anger, that can last a long time. It can. So take my word for it. I've learned from the, the school of hard knocks, he who can suppress a moment of anger may prevent a day or a week of sorrow. After all, as scripture says, your words can pierce like a sword or they can bring healing. Your words can stir up anger or they can turn away wrath. Your words can crush the spirit or be like a tree of life. That's a no-brainer in terms of what you wanna be, but it's that moment of weakness when you flare up that can just mess everything up. Slow down, take a deep breath, be patient. Number six, Give consideration as to the best words to use. Give consideration as to the best words to use. Uh, you know, this is really important like when you're gonna have a board meeting. It's really important when you're gonna confront someone over sin. Contemplate the best words to use. Uh, this is really important when there's gonna be a matter of church discipline. You need to give consideration to the right words to use. Or, or perhaps there's a husband and wife in your fellowship getting a divorce, sometimes it's good to meditate on the right words to use in talking to them. And this word here in uh, Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous weighs its answers, 
That's a word that carries the idea of meditating on. If you can almost picture a person murmuring with his lips as he ponders the right words to say, that's the idea that we see here. Now, consider this. Way back long ago, back in the days of Moses, when I was taking the book of Acts with Dr. Toussaint, we would always begin with a word of prayer. Dr. Toussaint would call on someone, we'd pray about the class and move on. But we had one particular student that had a problem. You see, this one student would start off fine in his prayers, and then about halfway through his prayer, his mind would go blank. Has that ever happened to you? You're praying along, your mind goes blank, and typically this student would wait for about maybe five seconds, and then he'd say something thoughtlessly, kind of strange, just to get the prayer over with. So one day, Dr. Toussaint calls on this guy to pray, and about in the middle of the prayer, it goes like this. And Father, we pray that what Dr. Toussaint teaches us today is true. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I cannot think of a worse thing to say in front of Dr. Toussaint. I mean, uh, <laughs> Dr. Toussaint was a gracious man and handled it well. But you got to wonder what was going through that guy's mind. What's even scarier is uh, this guy's probably got a church somewhere today. <laughs> so <laughs> weigh carefully the words that you use. Now, this is a funny example, but there's plenty of serious ones. If you weigh carefully what you say before you say it, it's going to smooth the path for future relations. I can promise it. And then number seven, our final principle. When in doubt, consider buying a one-way ticket to Quietsville. When in doubt, consider buying a one-way ticket to Quietsville. Uh, using fewer words will always stack the odds in your favor when you're uh, dealing with a situation. If you're not sure if you should say something, just don't say it. In fact, as Proverbs 17, verses 27 and 28 puts it, a man of knowledge uses words with restraint. Even a fool when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is considered prudent. So you don't always have to feel like you've got to say something. If you're in a situation and you're not sure that you should speak, keep quiet. You could give the illusion that you're a really wise person. All right? <laughs> I need to tell you something. As important as these seven principles are, I need to tell you that it's impossible for you to consistently live them in your own strength. None of us has the power to tame the tongue. That's what James says. It cannot be tamed. But what we've tried to do with these principles is to put parameters around the damage that the tongue can do. But even then, you in your own strength don't have the power to do it. That's why we need a divine assist. And one of my favorite passages in Scripture that deals with this is Psalm 141. You and I can pray along with the psalmist, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. You see, the psalmist didn't trust himself. I'm sure he was aware of the principles we've talked about this morning, but nevertheless, he did not trust his own lips. So we asked God, put a guard over my lips. I've got news for you. I don't trust my lips either. That's why I pray this prayer regularly. Set a guard, O oh Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. I especially pray this before I do radio. I don't want to do anything or say anything to somebody that calls in that's either going to dishonor the Lord or set a bad example. You see, I've seen it happen on too many other shows. There are some shows out there where people are rude to people who call in. They are condescending. I'm not going to mention any names. You probably know who I'm talking about anyway. But I, I ask God to watch over my lips so I won't do that. And uh, you ought to do it too. Uh, you ought to recognize that you cannot trust your lips because uh, if I was to take a poll in here today about how many of you have said something inappropriate just in the last month, I'd probably get every hand in the place going up. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth and keep watch over the door of my lips. And then finally, a real key to victory is walking in dependence upon the Holy Spirit being plugged into the Holy Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You see, this is the stuff that words of grace are composed of. As you walk in dependence upon the Holy Spirit, you're gonna find yourself with all kinds 
of interesting opportunities to put these seven principles into practice. And there's more than seven, by the way. I just got a short time to share with you. There's probably more like 15. But the fact is, is that as you walk in dependence upon the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will work in your life in such a way that these principles will be fulfilled. Now, my friends, take care of it now. We're going to dismiss in just a minute, but you know, I just want you to ponder for a moment in your own heart. Has the Spirit nudged your own heart in some area where you've got a problem with the tongue? How is it with your spouse? Have you said any sharp words? Do you have an ongoing habit of speaking sharp words to your spouse? How about your children? Do you have a habit of boasting to other seminary students? I used to hear some students boasting how they could preach better than the other guy. Yeah, sad to see. Is there a boasting problem? Is there a critical spirit that you sometimes have with other people? How is it when you're driving down the road? Do any words come into your mind as somebody cuts into your lane? I mean, there's just all kinds of questions I could ask you, but if the Spirit of God has nudged your heart, my urging to you is to act on it today. And if you're one of those individuals that does have a problem with the sharp tongue, take care of it. You could be good at everything else, Hebrew, Greek, theology, church history, and all of it. But that one problem could bring you down. You see, it's my prayer that that never happens again with any student that attends this seminary. I saw that crash and burn one time, and that was enough for me. So take it seriously. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that the Word of God is a barometer of truth that guides us and lights our path and helps us to understand very practical theology in areas of our lives. My Father, I pray for my fellow pilgrims here today that you would enable them to have victory in this area where so many of us have failed in the past. And I pray that the words that we speak, not just today, but throughout our entire ministries would be words that are seasoned by grace words that truly glorify you, and words that truly show other people that we are walking with the Master. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.